My name is Pippa Norris and I'm going to talk about trusting government redo, thinking about the role of information environments and cognitive skills on both trust and trustworthiness. And I'm delighted to join you. This is part of a broader work and I'm happy to share this and really think about some of the issues which have been classic issues in cross-cultural psychology, but also are really challenging today. So first I'll talk about the theoretical framework and it's derived from the new book which is coming out with Oxford University Press in uh, August and it's in praise of scepticism, trust but verify. I'll talk about the research design and the data and evidence, particularly from the World Value Survey, the results and the conclusions. So first let me start with the core argument. As we know, trust is one of those issues which has been around forever and there's a well-known fable about the frog and the scorpion. And the scorpion was walking along the banks of the river and he saw this frog and he wanted to cross to the other side. So he asked the frog and the frog said, yes, but we know that you might uh, hurt me if we go across or you might even kill me. And the scorpion says, no, no, that wouldn't be in our interest. We'd both drown. So the frog agreed and said, OK. And the scorpion got on their back. Halfway across, of course, the scorpion did what the scorpion did and stung. And the frog and the scorpion both drowned. And the frog says, why? And the scorpion says, it's in my nature. So the book is thinking about the normative assumptions about trust and the world in which we think that trust is normally have beneficial consequences. And to argue that we need to focus less on that than on trustworthiness. We need to understand that in fact, trust is a double-edged sword. Trust and legitimacy in particular is always good for the authorities. Doctors want you to believe in medicines. Lawyers want you to believe in, a, in the courts and the outcomes. Politicians want you believe, to believe in their promises. So if people trust, that's always valuable for getting things done and getting compliance, especially um, amongst uh, controversial issues. But for citizens, it's not always beneficial. And citizens make mistaken judgments, whether it's about charlatans in politics, whether about those who are seeking to defraud them of money, whether it's about those who are making claims, for example, like QAnon, about the vaccine, which are false. And the argument I'm making is that when we make judgments of trustworthiness, we might get them right, but we often make erroneous beliefs, like in any other judgment. And this involves two categories. One is cynical mistrust. We're very familiar with that. That's when the performance of the agent is positive, but in fact, we don't trust them and thereby we can miss out on certain opportunities. But the other, which has been underestimated, is credulous trust. And that's where we do trust another agent in order to accord to their promises, but in fact, they don't deliver. And they lack integrity, or they lack impartiality, or they lack competency. And the accurate evaluations are limited by two things. One is individual cognitive skills. It's often very difficult to make these judgments. How do I know whether an agency is actually going to be able to perform and whether they're going to do in future what they've done in the past? And secondly, of course, there's the information environment. And particularly, I'm arguing in closed societies where there's government censorship, where there's control of the press, and when there's one-sided perspectives rather than two-sided sources of information, that's where trust in particular can be misleading. And we need to build trustworthiness, especially in government, which means the competency, their ability to do things, integrity, their honesty and transparency, and their impartiality, their ability to serve the public rather than their own interests. We need effective institutional guardrails, not just individuals, to actually achieve these objectives. And the next set of research, which I'm arguing this field needs to work on, is not so much about democracy, but about authoritarian legitimacy. Why it is that people might trust those who are in fact uh, in power and uh, running states in very repressive ways with no respect for human rights or democracy. So let's unpack this. And it's from the book. And the book, as I said, looks like this in terms of the chapters. I'll take a bit from the opening theory and then I'll move on to some of the evidence and then key aspects of the conclusions and just show you some of the basic findings. So trust is multidisciplinary. Um, one of the reasons why we can 
it's been so important is that those who are, for example, interested in global governance and trust in other countries or between countries are interested in these sorts of relationships from international relations or cultural psychology, comparative politics or cross-cultural psychology. Trust in agencies of national government and civil society, for example, trust in the media or trust in NGOs or trust in politicians, that's been much more the focus of studies in political behaviour and comparative politics. And then lastly, we have social or interpersonal trust about which there's an enormous literature and that's primarily trust between individuals or between groups. And here we can think of studies in sociology and social psychology. Also, behavioural economics is very interested in that, in relationships between two individuals, and organisational studies in management. So it's multidisciplinary. But I'd argue that there are certain relationships here where conventionally trust is seen as a public good. And each of the different scholars that I'll mention just briefly are very familiar, so I won't go into them in depth. But for example, my colleague Bob Putnam argues that, that trust between people, social trust, facilitates social cooperation. If he wants to do something in the local area, um, those who think about personal relationships think that trust is the basis of marriage and relationships and friendships. Um, Francis Fukuyama argues in economics, it lubricates markets, particularly if the state is weak and if rule of law is, is not effective. But trust between, say, corporations allows trade Trust with consumers allows goods to be purchased and so on. Organisational literatures have really emphasised this as a way of management and that in particular for managers to manage large workforces there needs to be trust amongst the workers. It needs to strengthen political legitimacy and this is a classic claim ever since Gabriel Armand of the 1950s. It underpins rule of law and here the idea is that even if you don't fear a penalty you'll still obey the law if you trust the processes, the courts, the fairness and uh, the, the processes like the police. It can overcome polarisation and gridlock, work for example on Congress by Hetherington and Rudolph saying that the problem is parties can't work together, politicians can't work, but if they have trust they're more likely to come to some sort of bargaining and compromise. International peace, Bruce Russett and the argument that democracies which trust each other are going to have uh, uh, better relationships and cooperation and ultimately peace. And therefore, generally speaking, most of the literature, really from the mid 20th century onwards, has said we need trust to facilitate solidarity and cooperation within and across societies. If so, low and declining trust should be genuinely a matter of public concern. And of course, this assumption, this normative bias skews a lot of the media commentary as well. And we think about issues like Pizzagate in America and how there were conspiracy theories about um, a certain uh, pizza company. And we can think about QAnon and the way that people believe that and the conspiracies which surround it or the use of invective in medicines to overcome issues of COVID. And of course, January the 6th was classically seen as a breakdown of trust in Congress and a failure which led ultimately to deadly violence. Now, under that logic, you can certainly understand why people think trust is important, we need to restore trust. But if so, how do we actually think about the drivers of trust? What's the explanations? Well, I'd argue if you look at the literature, there are really three. First is in psychological studies and social psychology. This says trust is inherited. It's a characteristic from parents, or it's a fixed personality trait, just like people are born as optimist or pessimist, extra, extroverts or introverts. So they might be born as either trusting or mistrusting. And Olsena uh, developed a, 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 a monograph to studying how far that was the core and then thinking about the consequences. Similarly, Ron Inglehart, in his work, thinks about this less individually, more about societies. So if we compare, for example, trusting Sweden versus mistrusting uh, Russia. Or we think about other characteristics which are clear in each society. According to Inglehart, trust is learnt in early youth and in early childhood from the predominant norms and values, from teachers, from friends, from neighbours, from parents, from the society in which you live and work, and the values which are dominant within each society. And both of those are influential arguments. But the third argument is developed much more from economics and from rational choice theories. And this is about performance. And trustworthiness, 
not just individual trust, it's a relationship it's between a partner and it's about principles and agents. An informal social contract where principles authorise agents to act on their behalf, the expectation that the agent will fulfil their responsibilities in future with competency, integrity and impartiality. And this happens particularly where there are conditions of risks and uncertainty. So, for example, do I think that a, a surgeon is trustworthy when I need a heart operation, which is going to threaten my life? I might look at their past skills, their qualifications, uh, their, their, their information, and how far they've actually uh, been effective in their past performance. Or I might do the same if I'm trying to find a defence attorney, or if I'm thinking about whether a, a leader of a party is going to work in the national interest and are they, do they have the skills and capacities to do so? And are they honest and truthful? So trustworthiness is a relationship which we need to judge. Now, we can get that right, we can get that wrong. And that leads us to a nice fourfold typology, classic in any comparative politics. We can understand this as trust by principles, that's to say you and I, or citizens, or clients, which can be negative or positive, broadly speaking, and then agency performance by those that we're entrusting, which can be positive or negative. So if we think about cases like, say, the Swedish government, where people are highly trusting, then the relationship of the agency in terms of lack of corruption, in terms of good public services, of welfare, in terms of effective economic management, should mean that most citizens in Sweden do indeed have positive judgments and therefore that's sceptical trust. It's informed basis of when or not an agency, a government, a politician is trustworthy. But in other contexts, it's equally valuable to be mistrusting, particularly if the government or the, any other agent is ineffective, making promises that can't be believed, if they're populists who claim to speak for the people but in fact are amassing corrupt resources for themselves, if they deploy patronage in order to uh, make appointments rather than using impartial and independent standards. And so for many reasons, sceptical mistrust is something that's normatively appropriate. You should not trust agents who are not effective in their performance. After all, we teach children when they see strangers not to trust them. Now, in addition, however, there are the other two interesting categories. Cynical mistrust is where we don't trust an agent that's positive. So people who don't trust the COVID vaccine, when it's been proven beyond doubt that vaccination helps save your life, save your children's life, save the community spread, that's a form of cynical mistrust, which is misinformed. And similarly, we have the other position, which is credulous trust. And that's where you are trusting but you're trusting of those who are untrustworthy. And there are all sorts of reasons why we make those mistakes. We don't have the information. We don't have uh, the background. It's a technical issue. We don't know whether they're going to work in future like they have in the past and so on. So the model which develops looks like this. What we need to do to test this and find out which categories are there and then how we explain them is first to think about the judgments so we can look at a survey and make a look at trust in each other. It's a social trust or trust in the state or in international agencies like the United Nations or the World Health Organization. We need information about performance and that's independent of the surveys. Ideally, to be objective, you want some macro level indicators of competency, integrity and impartiality. So when the World Health Organization, for example, gives information about vaccinations, have they had the skills to deal with previous problems like Ebola? Do they have integrity or are they corrupt? And are they impartial, serving the interests of the countries and the member states? And then all of that can't work automatically. There's no link between performance to judgments except through public perceptions. In other words, we need to judge the performance. Even if it's good, it may be that we come to the contrary reasons and the reasons which create mistakes and errors are the individual analytical cognitive skills, our processing of information coming from our education, knowledge and interest and media access and use at an individual basis, but also, of course, at societal level.
the contrast between open and closed societies, those with media pluralism and those with one-sided information, uh, including media bubbles where we only get one-sided information, and the oversight mechanisms and the cultural values in society can be important as well. And those are intermediate conditions which basically help to explain how far there are, are accurate judgments between actual performance and our judgments of trustworthiness. And then there's a feedback loop. So if we trust somebody in some cases, we may continue to trust them further. Or if an agent loses trust, if we find that the government is ineffective or we just don't trust the individuals, politicians, if we've been lied to, then we might have a more negative evaluation of their performance in future. Now, how do we actually get research design and data? So for this, we're going to use the World Value Survey, European Value Survey, the seventh wave. I'm part of that, and we've been covering surveys ever since 1981, the very first wave, through to date, covering over 100 diverse societies, including some very close societies as well as open. I'll illustrate those. We have some good measures of interpersonal trust and institutional confidence, which have been in the survey since 1981. So we've got time series data. And then we've added trust in global governance and international agencies like the WHO um, and like NATO and like the IMF in the most recent wave. And the TrustGov project, which I'm a part of from the ESRC, funded 13 diverse societies, which are primarily author authoritarian and are closed, although quite varied. So you have theocracies, personal dictatorships, one-party states, um, uh, populist uh, authoritarian uh, uh, presidents, and so on, all the way from Ethiopia to Zimbabwe. The poll survey across all of the world value surveys looks like this, pretty good coverage worldwide, allowing us to generalise, obviously, in, in the global north, but also in much of the global south, except for, obviously, Africa, where we have much patchier coverage in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. We hope to improve that in future, but it's always a challenge to raise money for many countries. Um, and so we have a, a, a not, not such comprehensive coverage in that region. And this is what it looks like when we start to classify the societies in the seventh wave. That's the most recent wave. And we can see we have liberal democracy on the vertical axis and we have freedom of expression on the horizontal axis. Both of these measures are measures from the Variety of Democracy project. So it's not a survey based measure, it's based on expert assessments matched to the year of the survey in the seventh wave. And you can see that some countries are particularly authoritarian and low in freedom of expression. China, Tajikistan, Belarus, Azerbaijan, Vietnam all come into that category. Russia, Iran, Thailand. And then at the opposite quadrant, we can see countries which are highly democratic according to the continuous index and with good freedom of expression, which includes media pluralism, lack of censorship and so on, and countries like the Netherlands, Denmark, Finland, but also some other newer democracies. Um, South Korea is in that category, Slovakia is in that country category, uh, Peru, Argentina. Obviously, there's a few outliers here and there, cases which shifted, particularly cases like Hungary, Singapore, Ethiopia and Myanmar. But nevertheless, we can see there is a broad relationship between the two. And in order to get our measure of public opinion, the World Value Survey has all of these dimensions of trust in global governance, national governments, social movements, the media, out-group trust and in-group trust. I'm only going to present some of the results from the National Governance Trust although obviously it's open to analysis across all these different levels. So the research design and strategy, first we measure public opinion and trust in diverse agents and societies. Then we measure independently, if we can, both subjective perceptions, but above all, objective indices of agency performance. Then we compare the two. If they correlate, then that's an accurate perception, irrespective of whether it's high or low trust the results. Well, let's just start by looking a little bit at some of the very simple correlations between a variety of performance indicators, 
and the mean trust in government scale. The trust in government scale is standardised. It includes trust in government, parliaments, parties and the civil service. It's a 100 point scale for each societies. And we've seen across the uh, a range of different indicators, various measures from the World Development uh, Bank, World Development Indicators, basic ones that we're always using, like economic growth, economic development, unemployment, as well as others like levels of economic, de economic inequality and social indicators like education, longevity, maternal mortality. And what I've shown you here is simply the correlations without any controls for open societies and for closed in the relationship of trust in government and performance. First, if we look at the open societies highlighted in green, we have between 25 and 43 open societies in the comparison, depending on the uh, uh, item under, under analysis, uh, based on around about 30,000 individual surveys, uh, individual uh, respondents. What you can see if you look down, quite simply, is the correlation is there. It's normally in the direction that one would expect, and it's often, but not always, statistically significant. Now, economic growth, as you would expect, that's to say change in per capita GDP. Yes, m people are more trusting in countries with higher economic growth. People are particularly more trusting in countries with greater uh, economic development per capita GB GDP. They're more negative in their trust in countries with high levels of unemployment. They're more negative in countries with high levels of economic inequality and they're more positive in those with economic equality. Higher education, very strongly related to high levels of trust. Partly, I'd argue, because this gives us the cognitive skills, which I mentioned earlier, and it gives us better ways of information and judging the performance of government. The more informed you are, the better you can use the media, the more you can know what's going on in the state. Another indicator, however, which is equally strong, but negative, homicide rates. And obviously that's nothing to do with information, but basically countries with high levels of homicide, where people are insecure, high levels of crime as well, are negatively associated with trusting government. If the government doesn't even provide um, security, think about the n numbers of shootings and mass shootings um, in, in the United States just over the weekend and over a longer period, people don't trust government. Longevity is positive. The longer you live, the more you trust government, but it's not significant in the cases that we have. Maternal mortality is not significant. So not every indicator points in the same direction, because a lot of them do. What about the closed societies? Remember those which are classified according to the Variety of Democracy Project by freedom of expression, just as a dichotomy. And again, we have 18 to 39 countries, depending on the comparison we're looking at. And again, about 30,000 cases, uh, individual respondents. What you can see immediately is that most of these are not significant. There's no relationship between performance and trust in government, whether it's economic growth, economic development, inflation, levels of economic inequality, social indicators, etc., etc. The only exception is unemployment, which does turn out to be statistically significant. On the other hand, what we're looking at here is a variety of indicators because you don't want to cherry pick. You don't want to pick one indicator of performance versus another. And what we can see is that most of them are unrelated to overall levels of trust in government. What does this look like? Well, when I start to show you a few scatter plots, immediately the, the findings become much clearer because you can dig down into particular countries and cases. So what we've got here are the countries which are highlighted in green, which are the ones which are open societies, and the countries which were in red which are classified by freedom of expression as closed societies. And the regression line is shown when we compare, in this case, per capita GDP with levels of uh, basically trust in government. And immediately you can see there's a relationship in the open societies, in Switzerland, in Norway, in Sweden, there's high levels of trust and high levels of per capita GDP. In countries like Mexico and Peru in particular, or Tunisia or Guatemala, these are open societies, and there's low levels of trust, and there's low levels of per capita GDP. There's one exception or two exceptions which jump out. Um, Hong Kong, for example, jumps out, but that's a radically changing society which was open and indeed very affluent by economic growth standards. Uh, so that starts to explain 
why that's an outlier and Singapore is always an outlier. Whatever you do, it's always one of the most affluent states, but also a one party state, which is opening up somewhat, but hasn't yet broken through with the opposition. If we look, however, at the other closed societies, what you can see in the countries in red is that the regression line is flat. China has greater trust in government than in Sweden. Vietnam has greater trust than in Norway. The Philippines have more trust than in Switzerland. Now, some people say, well, you just can't measure trust in these countries. People won't answer honestly. Um, elsewhere in the book, I do address that. We, we ran some experimental surveys uh, and we split our sample to see whether or not there was a substantial response bias. The answer was that the response bias was there, but it was fairly modest. It doesn't explain all the variations or the reason why trust is so much higher in China than it is in many of the Western uh, democracies which are included in this comparison. Instead, what you can see is that in closed societies, then they can uh, manipulate information. People don't have information particularly about the government performance, which is accurate. They don't know whether inflation is high or low uh, relative to uh, uh, other trends. Uh, they don't know about the effectiveness of the government performance very, very clearly. And so in that case, we can see that there's no relationship at all between per capita GDP and trust in government. What about other measures? What about good governance? What about the World Bank indicators? Is this a better measure? Well, it basically tells a similar story. So here, performance is not about policy. It's about the quality of how people are being governed. We have the Good Governance Index from the World Bank, which is a composite, and it's six different measures, control of corruption, government effectiveness, political stability, and so on, rule of law. Then we also added the VDEM, Variety of Democracy Measure of Liberal Democracy. What do you see? Well, sorry, in open societies, what you can see, if I just go back, oh, well, you can't see that. Anyway, in open societies, there is a relationship and in closed societies, there isn't a relationship. Let me show you this in terms of this graph instead of the correlations. First, if we look at the Good Governance Index, remember that's made up of six different components. And what we've got is the Trust in Government Index across the bottom and the Good Governance Index on the, on the vertical index. And it's the same procedure as before. And you can see there's a strong relationship. The better the government, according to objective indicators, in its performance, say rule of law, uh, or its efficiency, then the stronger the trust in a Norway, in a Sweden, in a Switzerland, in a Canada, in an Austria, in an Estonia, in a Taiwan, in a Lithuania. The worse the performance in a Romania, in a Croatia or Peru, or Guatemala, or Ecuador, or Ukraine, then in those open societies, then there's a, a negative relationship, less trust, with less quality of governance. In the countries highlighted in red, which are the closed societies, there's no relationship. So it's not about the quality of governance which causes people to trust the government in Vietnam or China or Tajikistan or the Philippines or Myanmar or Bangladesh or Azerbaijan or, or Kyrgyzstan. Instead, by and large, it is a flat line. People are being judged based on the information environment and the information they get from government, not on objective indicators of performance. And it's even more true if we look at patterns of democracy. And here we have our trusting government scale across the bottom, as always, and then liberal democracy on the, on the vertical axis. And you can see that in countries in red, there's a negative relationship. The more democratic the society, the less autocratic it is, the less, uh, uh, sorry, the more more people trust it. By contrast, if we see the positive relationship in the open societies, the better the democracy, according to VDEM, then the greater the level of trust. So this gives us our four categories, and we end up with credulous trust in the closed societies, where people have limited information in order to judge the quality of performance, and they might well believe that um, the government is effective in a North Korea, in a Myanmar, in, in a Kazakhstan, in Azerbaijan, but in practice, according to the World Bank indicators and objective indicators, both of policy and 
the way that they work, the performance is poor. And in contrast, in the democracies, the better the performance, the more so the sceptical trust. And the cynical mistrust is where the performance isn't that bad in terms of governance, but people don't trust it. And the sceptical mistrust is where the performance is bad, as in Nicaragua, and indeed people don't trust it. So here are the four concepts, and here how, is how they're operationalized. So what's the conclusions? Well, I said them at the beginning, basically. It's thinking about the normative assumptions whenever we say, isn't it bad that trust has gone down? Well, no, it isn't. It's only a problem if there's a change in performance and if people mistake uh, their evaluations of performance so they're making erroneous judgments. In other words, just like many other judgments, we need to know how informed they are, how rational they are. And if they're poorly informed, then trust uh, is not necessarily a desirable consequence. And again, one can think of all of those who are following, for example, the big lie in America. When you ask people, is the was the election of 2020 fraudulent? Eight out of 10 Republicans says yes. They do not believe that President uh, Joe Biden was elected legitimately. That's a problem. That's credulous trust. But it's not only, of course, in America. It's also there in many parts of the world where states know that if they manipulate propaganda, if they control the flow of information, then they can be legitimized through that process. They induce compliance. And we need to build government trustworthiness, including capacity to deliver, integrity and transparency and impartiality, but above all, institutional guardrails of accountability and effectiveness, which can actually make sure that governments are trustworthy and that if they're not, they're removed from office. And so the next stage of the work is really to think about this in more depth, for me, in the authoritarian countries, in the countries lacking freedom of expression, and to really understand in more depth what public opinion is and whether or not we can say that there is genuine legitimacy in terms of how far people trust their leaders, how far people trust single parties, how far people trust the state in the absence of effective information that could give them uh, uh, information to judge and make these sorts of judgments in accurate ways. Of course, it's not simply about authoritarian states. As I mentioned, the American case, it's many countries where information is is held in information bubbles. But in all these cases, we need to think, how do we build trustworthiness, not how do we build trust? And this is the book. You can find it all coming out 2nd of August in another few weeks with Oxford University Press. And I hope it resets some of the work. I've been thinking about these issues now for many, many years. I started this work with Critical Citizens in 1999. I always said at the time that there was normative ambiguities in some of our core concepts. And I hope this book, um, after 20 years, actually gets to the heart of some of these issues and helps us both conceptualise it and then think much harder about the evidence we might want to use to really operationalise this and then think about other drivers which might be there, which could easily, again, skew people's judgments about trustworthiness. Thank you very much. I very much look forward to your questions and to participating albeit at a distance, through our, our, our conference. And I look forward to seeing you all uh, at that, at that uh, meeting uh, shortly. Thank you very much. <laughs>